Howard Cosell called it rule number one of the jockocracy, the idea that sports and politics just don't mix. And yet, if we accept that as a truism, it becomes very difficult to explain certain things. It becomes very difficult to explain why people associate Jackie Robinson and the integration of Major League Baseball with the early days of the Civil Rights Movement. It becomes difficult to explain why Muhammad Ali was such a symbol of resistance in the 1960s. It becomes difficult to explain Billie Jean King and the fight for Title IX and women's liberation. It becomes difficult to explain why it was such big news recently when athletes like Steve Nash, Sean Avery, and Michael Strahan spoke out for marriage equality in New York City. It becomes difficult to explain why it became a huge deal when a football player named Richard Mendenhall and a basketball player named Chris Douglas Roberts just tweeted that they weren't going to join the celebration after the killing of Osama bin Laden because saying that they didn't see why we would celebrate and have a big frat party which seemed to be breaking out across the country given the hundreds of thousands of people who've died in the war on terror and the trillions of dollars spent. I mean, Richard Mendenhall lost his endorsements for goodness sakes. And you know what else it doesn't explain, to say sports and top politics don't mix? It doesn't explain why sports, even when it's at its most normal, is such a staging ground for nationalism, patriotism, jingoism, not to mention sexism. I mean, I live in a town where people root for a team called the Redskins, for goodness sake, so racism there too. So sports covers every possible corner of the political world. So when people say sports and top politics don't mix, I think there are two kinds of people who say this. The first are people who are progressive, radical, on the left, who just think sports is just this wholly right-wing thing. So they, it's the Noam Chomsky argument. They just say, ugh, all sports is is something that deflects us from other realities. That's all it is. So we should have nothing to do with it. We should ex abstain from it the way a vegetarian abstains from McDonald's. That's one side of it. The other side are people in the official power structure of sports who say sports and politics don't mix. And these folks are really saying sports and a certain kind of politics don't mix because they're more than happy with the nationalism, the patriotism, the sexism, all that stuff, the corporatism. They, they, they're fine with those politics. It's resistance politics that they have a problem with. But as I said before, there is a rich tradition of resistance politics in sports that spans the past, the present and the future and the work I try to do is to unearth some of that history and bring it forward for a new generation of people, many of whom are in fact sports fans. Sports fans really do come in all different shapes, sizes and colors and the reason for that is because I think sports is the closest thing we really have to a national unifying culture in this country, the closest thing we have to what connotes casual conversation between people in a society like ours that frankly degrades politics. Like because people think politics are dirty, because people feel degraded to even discuss politics or religion or the rest of it, it it's, sports becomes that point of connection for people. And I've had a lot of people say to me like, like hey, I, I got your book and gave it to my dad and we finally had like a a real political discussion because we did it through sports. Like, hey dad, do you remember Muhammad Ali? What did you think about him at the time? And then a real discussion happens about the 1960s. It's almost like sports allows us a safe language to have discussions that are otherwise difficult for people to have. So it's hard for, for me to really say like, what is a sports fan? I would just say a sports fan has more going on in their head than people who disabuse sports fans give them credit for and that goes for people on the left who write off sports fans as an audience and for the corporate powers that be who think all people want is a a cold beer and a warm brat i think that's a part of what makes sports powerful whether you're together as a team when we live in such an atomized society or when you're together watching a game together and have that feeling of just yelling with tens of thousands of other people I mean, oftentimes that, re that kind of setting really is used to deflect people away from, from struggle. You know, it's like you get out and you burn off steam through cheering, but it's not so one-sided as to say once people are on that avenue, they're divorced from politics or mass struggle. I mean, the recent revolution in Egypt, uh, some of the early people who sprung to life and set up checkpoints and combated the state police 
were in fact the soccer clubs of Egypt. And the reason why these soccer clubs have been allowed to exist for so many decades in Egypt under the totalitarian regime is because they were seen as something that would allow people to blow off steam that might otherwise be directed at the regime. And yet by blowing off all that steam, it had actually schooled a generation of young Egyptian men and actually had to fight the police, had to set up barricades and do all the things that became very necessary in Tahir Square. You know, owners don't want these kinds of discussions happening and owners hate these discussions for two reasons. Uh, the first is that most owners are roughly to the right of Attila the Hun and they have like I love Ayn Rand tattooed on their buttocks. Most of them made their money the old fashioned way by inheriting it and most of them think because they have the biggest check in the room, they have the biggest brain in the room which means they've also largely mismanaged their sports to horrific degrees, which is why we now have lockouts in the NFL and the NBA. It's not because there's a crisis in interest in sports, it's that there's a crisis of profitability because they've mishandled these golden geese to such an extent. The other reason that they don't want to have these discussions is because there is a model that is spread by athletes as much as it's spread by owners. And the model is we make as much money as possible if we offend as few people as possible. So what they do is they take the trappings of rebellion, and Nike is a genius at this. You take the trappings of rebellion, but you strip it of its content. So rebellion becomes little more than a brand. You know, there's an expression about athletes when they retire and their relationship with the public and the press, that athletes finally want to say hello when everyone else is saying goodbye. And the problem is that yes, a lot of retired athletes have said radical things, but once you're retired, I think you lose a lot of your cultural capital. I mean, what makes an athlete powerful as a political spokesperson is that they command an audience. And unfortunately, athletics is a very cruel business. And once you're done, you're done. Like Michael Jordan, for example, was notoriously apolitical as a player uh, in, in infamously saying Republicans buy sneakers too as a defense for why he wouldn't stand up to Jesse Helms. Now, after Michael Jordan retired, uh, he supported uh, the presidential aspirations publicly of uh, Bill Bradley in 2000. But no one really knew, and people who did know didn't really care. And maybe part of that is because Bill Bradley was such a wet sock as a candidate, but it's more because it's like, okay, who cares what retired Michael Jordan is saying or doing politically? Now, there are exceptions to this. Uh, the best one is Charles Barkley who said some brilliantly radical things since his retirement. But one of the reasons is that Charles Barkley, it's not, he's not an ex-athlete, he's a television star who happened to play basketball. So he has his own cultural capital that he's developed in his post-playing career. But as far as athletes who are just retired athletes and maybe playing the golf circuit or opening a business, having something political to say, no, nah, it, it, it just doesn't have the, the same weight that it would have had if they had spoken out while um, an athlete themselves.